thanks so much for joining us today. Happy Intersex Awareness Day. I'm Joshua Benedict. This is the original Inter Intersex Connect Live. And today we're doing a bit of an experiment. We're doing actually a room with a lot of people in it. And we're doing Hi. it online Woo. as well. So um, I'm sitting in a chair so I don't stand and walk away from the camera. Because <laughs> I have a tendency to do things like that. But before we get going, the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I give a good shout out to the LGBTQ sector of Southern Nevada. Because none of this would happen happened with that. I came here approximately three years ago and I took the uh, center advocacy training because I talked to a lot of intersex people all the time and I wanted to make sure I wasn't breaking people and that I was doing good things and not bad things. So I came to that training here and I met a person named Dr. Ray McFarland who is no longer with the center but they brought me in to meet everybody in the center and got things going and made amazing things happen. So I just want to make sure that I give the best shout out I possibly can to the LGBTQ plus center of Southern Nevada. And I thank them so much for doing all their work and all the amazing stuff that they have done to make this happen. All right, so now this whole episode today is about being a good advocate for the intersex community. And I have a special guest, but before I bring the special guest on, I would like to um, talk a little bit about my own advocacy because I've been doing this for roughly 10 years. It all depends on when you decide I was mad and I was actually doing something and picking the date. I've written to the last three presidents we've had over 700 letters. Um, most of my advocacy, though, has been aimed towards legislation, trying to create laws to help the intersex community and stop unnecessary intersex surgeries. I reached a certain point where I realized that that probably wasn't the best use of my energies. Because you may ask yourself, exactly who's advocating to do unnecessary surgeries on infant children? And there's only one organization that we're up against, and that is the Society of Pediatric Urology. The Society of Pediatric Urology has $50 million a year budget to fight legislation that would limit intersex surgeries in any way, shape, or form. So anytime that I've been able to work on a legislative project, they've always been able to get in the uh, um, praise for the exception of the parent's mental health so that they may be able to bond with their own child. And... Um, if you're a parent and your child needs to have cosmetic surgery so that you can bond with them, you may want to reconsider being a parent. But they keep putting this in the law. And the reason why I don't like it in the law is because according to the 2017 um, Pediatric Journal of Urology, 94% of the parents that are presented with the option to do cosmetic surgery on their child do cosmetic surgery on their child. And I think that's a horrible thing. And I'd like to blame the parents, but I can't. Because with the laws that they're trying to pass now in some of the southern states, they are actually making laws against intersex people. They approximately make 4,000 transgender people out of the intersex community when they do surgeries on them every single year. And then they make laws to prevent them from participating in sports, using restrooms, and they take every opportunity to tell them that they are mentally ill. I can totally understand why a parent would say cosmetic surgery prevents all that. It might be a good idea. So my advocacy has changed. My advocacy now is to get everybody in the world to understand what intersex is, accept that intersex people exist, and to Assure the parents of intersex children that when their child gets to kindergarten without cosmetic surgery, they will still be allowed to use a restroom. And when they get to the school, they will um, be able to participate in sport without cosmetic surgery. That's my goal, is to make this such a normal thing that it is not a problem for, for a parent to decide that they actually want to have their child live a normal life 
based on um, the way they were born, as opposed to the way that they were perceived to be. Uh, they don't fit in the binary, and if we don't have a child that fits in the binary, we surgically alter them so that they do fit within the binary. Um, and that's like a, a horrible thing. Anyway, let me get off my soapbox about trying to create legislation that isn't going to work. And I would like to talk about our next guest. I am so proud to be able to call this person a friend. But Bosch Bodie, oh, yep, there we go. Bosch Bodie is a broadcast journalist, a performing artist, a patent holding inventor, a life coach, an activist. And you can currently see him every Friday on the Black Press National Newspapers Publishers Association first openly LGBTQI program. He said, he said, he said, live. Now, here to talk about radio and, oh, no, we're not doing that part. But here to talk about his advocacy work and all the amazing things he's done, ladies and gentlemen, Bosch Bodie. Hey. Hey, Bosch. <laughs> I'm doing great. Hi, Joseph. Hi, everybody. Happy Intersex Awareness Day. This is awesome. Yeah, it is. All sorts of people here, too. We've got like three times as many people as last year in this room. That's awesome. So, That's awesome. It and it's kind of yeah. momentous, Joseph. Like you're doing a, a live studio audience and a, a, a live stream. I don't think I've seen anyone do that yet. So hats off to you. We're breaking new ground. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> we really didn't think about all the problems that could come from this. <laughs> like uh, feedback so you'll find that i'm sitting not only so i don't walk out of the camera but i'm also sitting so i don't walk in front of the microphone and cause tremendous amounts of feedback online so <laughs> anyway Bob, I have questions for you get us going if that's all right right on right on um and i want to commend you on all the activism work you're doing and everything that you're you're doing you're amazing i'm happy to call you friend as well so much. i appreciate that it's kind of unique because I can't really see the questions online unless I really squint and have my glasses on. But um, and Bash can't see anybody in the room, so <laughs> Bosch, excuse me, cannot see anybody in the room, and uh, so it's a, a little unique in that perspective. Anyway, so some of these questions, if you did. Have actually see our show last Saturday. It was the first ever, the original interconnect of the show live. And uh, I actually talked to Bosch then. And um, Bosch has been very instrumental in making this happen today. So um, some of these questions you may have heard the other day, but the first two or three, and then after that, it's all different stuff. So I promise you, I'm not just repeating. All right. So now, first of all, Bosch, are you intersex? No, I am not. All right, so if you're not intersex, then how did you ever hear about intersex in the first place? Well, I've been doing a radio for about the last 12 years um, with IMRU Radio, which is the nation's longest running LGBTQI radio news magazine. Um, I got involved as part of activism once Prop 8 passed. I was living in Los Angeles. Prop 8 passed, which defined marriage between a man and a woman in California. And that was really the first time that I had really experienced rights being taken away from me, which, you know, I'm a fighter for everyone else. I thought, this is really ridiculous. So I got really involved with all the protests and through a series of events ended up getting involved with IMRU radio. I started doing reading the news for the syndicated program that goes around the world to all the LGBTQI radio news magazine programs around the world. And then I started getting involved with the radio program. Can you explain what IMUR is? Uh, IMRU, it's a radio, it's a radio program uh, out of Los Angeles. It was started in 1974, um, you know, as part of the movement for gay rights. And we'll, we could talk a little bit more about how it started with gay rights and how it evolved. But, 
you know, lots of people were involved with that. Lily Tomlin was originally involved with IMRU Radio. And actually, when we share some of our old archive stuff, you can actually hear her doing some of her characters and voices and things back in 1974, uh, fighting for gay rights. So I was working with the radio program, and there were all different kinds of people involved. And there was this one woman who was heavily involved, and she kept mentioning her husband. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd for a lesbian to have a husband. So I <laughs> asked her uh, what was going on. And she says, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not gay or lesbian, I'm straight. And I thought that was odd. So I said, well, why are you here? And she said that everyone needs to always be looking around to see who they can help lift up. So I thought, well, let me look around and see who else is available because we had gays and lesbians and there were bi people and trans people that came through and I saw the eye and I thought, well, let me research that. Let me see what's going on. And I found out it was intersex and had to do with really science and biology and the body. And I thought that is for me. And since then I have considered myself an intersex activist. So you pretty much discovered intersex on your own. Is that correct? I was, a light was turned on that there was someone else other than the gay and lesbians and trans and bi people. And yeah, I took the initiative as I typically do, as you know, uh, to sort of go out and, and find where change needs to happen and make it happen. Um, by the way, you've got a lot of folks who are listening uh, and watching. You have the uh, intersex group from Asia who has said hello. You have a group from Canada who have said hello. Um, and then there are people who have said hello to you, have said hello to me. Um, My apologies for not saying hi back to everybody when your thing comes up because I can't see the computer very well. You, or I you can't see. I'll, I'll let you know what's happening. I'll let you know what's <laughs> happening when people comment. But uh, the, whoever's chiming in from Canada has said that they did radio there in Winnipeg. So awesome. hello to the radio folk. Yes, but then I turn around and look, huh? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll give you a point when you're up there. There you go. So then, Bosch. Yeah. About intersex, and you found out that it was kind of your groove or where your calling was coming into. But how does that go from, well, these people need my help to, I'm actually going to advocate for these people because. They need help and I can make a difference. Well, I'd already been given the, the forum on the radio program. So what our advocacy is when we're doing the radio is interviewing people, sharing their stories, telling their stories. So I started doing that pretty much almost right away. I reached out to Hida, who I found was living in Oakland. I was like, hey, we can we get together? And so we did. I think that was, um, gosh, that's been a while ago that I first met her or them. He actually uses all pronouns. So, you know, I feel okay using all of them with when talking about Hida. But that was really a good springboard. I mean, there was just so much energy and so much simpatico. I mean, I feel that being a, a gay black person, that there are many avenues and things that are sort of set up to block my rights it just seemed like such the perfect fit. And it's such a diverse community that it, it challenged me to learn more. And I like that process. I like the learning process. Well, that's awesome. We certainly appreciate all the advocacy that you do for us. And um, if you don't know who Hida Valoria is that Bosch mentioned, Hida Valoria is an intersex advocate that wrote, wrote the book Born Both. I highly recommend you give it a read. It's on audiobook. And um, actually, Hida reads the audiobook. So you can actually get it from the author as far as how that goes. So I highly recommend that you do that. All right, so Vosh, you've been an advocate for about a dozen years now. <laughs> yeah. It's... I always ask everybody because I kept running into brick walls in my advocacy. But mm -hmm. have you found anything that just didn't work and you were sorry you tried it? Um. I find that when I uh, just sort of jump into talking about intersex with people, which I often do just because I, it's just such a passion for me that I gotta, I have to ease my way into it. But other than that, 
anytime I can talk about intersex, intersex people, variations, laws, uh, IGM, I take it because I'm always planting a seed knowing that eventually it is going to pay off. I like that idea because yeah. um, my attitude is if people are talking about intersex, even if they don't get it all correct, the fact that they're talking about it is a good thing. Um, exactly. Most people are like, well, you don't even exist. Oh, so. <laughs> exactly. Um, what worked really well for your advocacy? I have gotten down a really good elevator pitch about what intersex is in a way that hooks people in that they just want to know more because I really make it personal for people. Like I just talk about human development and that seems to really, you know, grab people. And again, I, I do radio, so I'm a really good storyteller. Um, I've just done a series of interviews on intersex where I interviewed people just normal people about their lives and who they are. I know, Joseph, you're one of them. You're actually the first one. Um, anyone who's watching now, if you go to the original Intersex Connect, you can actually see the, the premiere episode. It hasn't aired anywhere else. IMRU Radio hasn't even gotten it yet. Um, but I find that making it personal, making it more than just this umbrella term that people don't understand is really what drives it home because Intersex rights are human rights, and everyone is really interested in human rights in some Absolutely. level or another. Absolutely. I totally agree with you on that. Um, the folks from Interact have, have chimed in, by the way. I'm going to let you know who's, who's saying hello and saying things to you. But you've got the folks from Interact who are saying happy Intersex Awareness Day, which is great. <laughs> I that. Um, so my next question because I know you've studied intersex a lot. Um, there's a period there where you may have known more than I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> in those interviews, I was like amazed at how much research you did on your own. When you were doing your research, what was the most horrifying, disturbing, whatever thing that you read and you went, oh my God, they do this to human beings? Yeah, well, <sighs> kind of all of the unnecessary surgeries were a little bit disturbing just because I would just imagine that it had happened to me and that just did not seem right. And how that affected people as they grew up. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to be candid once upon a time, not that long ago, I was a hoe. So to think that other people might not be able to enjoy sex uh, was very, very disturbing. I mean, that really still resonates with me. So I, I'm very set on making sure that people get to stay in the bodies that they were born in to be able to experience those bodies. Because from a spiritual standpoint, that's what I believe. I believe that we as spirits experience our this plane, this existence through sex and through intense emotion. And to cut someone else off of part of that human experience that our spirit is supposed to have is extremely disturbing on a very, very, very deep level. I can totally understand that. That's pretty much what my problem is with it. Um, my other problem is, is that they will walk up to Mr. and Mrs. Smith and say, here's your baby daughter. We just cut her penis off for you. Just look for an inspection and otherwise there's nothing else. And then right. they're nothing else. If they change pediatricians, the next doctor is not going to believe them. If they don't ever tell that person their entire life that they were born intersex and had surgery like my parents did to me, right. the doctor is doctor's going to tell them to pull a cap. They're going to tell them that doesn't exist. You're lying. My doctor told me I was a liar and had me drug tested. So I know this. And it was all in my medical records by that time. So that's like disturbing to me. Um, the other thing I find really disturbing is the barrier that it creates between parent and child. I mean, you just alluded to the fact that there's now this big secret that a parent has with their child. And, you know, that's also a very disturbing thing. I mean, parents are supposed to protect their children and to have a medical practitioner step in between that. I mean, how does one really? Absolutely. Uh, I always had a problem with parents lying to children. Um, I even 
support some people that told their children that Santa Claus doesn't exist. <laughs> I never told my child that there was a Santa Claus. I told him to pretend for the word go, and my son believed me. Because <laughs> it's something important. It's like, dude, I didn't lie to you about Santa Claus, and I'm not lying to you now. Right. We right. need to lie. And right. the fact that I can say I didn't lie to you when you were four is a very good hook for yeah. being able to um, let your children understand that when you're honest with them, you are, and that you're not ever going to lie to them. Exactly. Uh, so what do you think that the average person could do to help uh, advocate for the intersex community? Well, the first thing I think that people can really do is something that they can just do for themselves and for general humanity, which is to stop holding themselves to false images and expectations about what it means to be a male or a female or a beautiful person or a lovable person on the planet. So whatever anyone can do to do that, that's only going to help their mental health and actually help them see that people show up in all different kinds of ways on the planet. So that's the first thing that I would say that the average lay person can do. Help us all out by doing that. The other thing that people can really start doing is, is stop conflating sex and gender. Right, man. <laughs> right? That is a gateway into understanding that both of those things are able to exist outside of a binary and that's only going to advance the conversation. That sounds like a really good thing for everybody to do. And the last thing I would add, pardon? the last thing I would add is, is that the average person can start including the I in whatever initialism they use to describe the queer community because. Absolutely, please always include the intersex in your human rights campaign. Yeah because we are all about the human rights. Right. All right, so now the, um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Because okay. you do have that presentation loaded up that we talked about two weeks ago, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Okay, I want to make sure before I drop you into that. Because okay. we actually studied the history of how the GLBTQ came together even though now it's LGBTQ. And um, I wonder if you could sit there and tell us a little bit about how we got to LGBTQ based on your studies. I'm gonna tell you now that there are articles and things written out. So if you want a really in-depth understanding, I would highly recommend you know just going out to Google and, and doing a search. I'm gonna give you sort of a high level of what happened. I mean, we... we, we you know, yeah, I mean, and it, it parallels what happened with our radio program. We started off as gay. I mean, that was just sort of describing anybody who was outside, you know, within the queer community. We were just gay. Uh, then we added the lesbian, and then we were gay and lesbian. And we were that for a while. Uh, in fact, the Gay and Lesbian Center, uh, which is now, I guess, is the LGBTQ center in Los Angeles was the gay and lesbian center for a very long time to the point where it was really uncomfortable that they had not added the bi and the trans to their name. So I think that happened in almost like 2010-ish, like it was a long time. So uh, we were the GLBT, gay, lesbian, bi and trans. Well, at certain point in time, that shifted and became LGBT. Then we started adding other letters, like the queer. I mean, as, as different groups and organizations became uh, more active in their own advocacy, we started adding more letters until the point we got to LGBTQII, no, LGBTQIAA, uh, P2. I mean, we tried to include everyone because as everyone steps into the fold, you know, we wanted to make sure that everyone was, had a seat at the table. Well, like well, a friend of mine says that as long as they keep passing transgender legislation against transgender people, we're going to add a letter every time <laughs> they try and pass it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, 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 ah. Well, you know, I'm all for it because I think that as we find out that there are more people that need recognition that as a, a coalition, as a group, a community searching for the same thing, which is equal rights, we, we owe it to everyone to represent them. 
that I hope someday that all those letters just turn into the word human. Well, I mean, I think that that is part of the reason why it's so important to include the I, uh, because I believe that we understand that the definition of intersex are, are people who are born with, you know, any of several characteristics that fall outside of what is typical male or female in terms of bodies. Well, if we start our conversation there, adding these other letters of this understanding of how other things exist, they're already made sense based on the notion that we understand that our concept of what is typical male and typical female is not set in stone. It's not typical. Uh. <laughs> it, well, exactly. I mean, we can go common or uncommon, but either way, it's not set in stone. It's not the only thing. So it really advances our conversation in a lot of ways. Right. So now the reason why I drove you into this is because <laughs> you came up with an idea that I threw out there and I thought I was going to get hung <laughs> when I said it. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, is a suggestion for putting the letter I first. Um, well, yeah, definitely. In, in terms of like, again, with advocacy and, and doing working with the radio program, another thing I've done with my advocacy is trying to get other organizations to adapt and add the I, right? That's a whole big movement to add the I. And, you know, I would put out uh, questionnaires and do surveys and, and to find out how people saw the initialism and, and where they thought they should go with it. And it was amazing how people always said, oh, it's too many letters. Once we get past the Q, it's just too much. It's a mouthful. Uh, I, I just got really sick in, uh, of hearing that. I, like I said, I think the I is the most important thing. And so I decided that since someone else was able to change the initialism from GLBT to LGBT, I could do that. I'd gone to uh, a few retreats, one of which was the Cutie Pock, Queer Trans People of Color. I really liked that Cutie Pock. I thought that was really kind of catchy. So I was just sitting down one day and I thought, I'm, uh, I'm gonna resolve this. I'm gonna come up with a way that if it's too many letters, people can drop their own, but I'm putting intersex first and I'm gonna make it catchy. And, and so I did. So uh, I, I kind of introduced it a little while ago, maybe a few weeks ago. People seem to like it. I, I would love to share it. Can I share it? Please do. All right. It, it's, it is a participatory little video, but I'm just going to play the video. And I, I want you guys to, to say it. If you're at home, I want you to say it. If you're in the audience, I want you to say it. I, I, because I think it's worthwhile. Here it is. LG. I think you're the LG. <laughs> That's it. I be QDLG. Before you know it, it's off your tongue. It gets, you know, I think it's catchy. I, I really do believe that it can take over and really change the conversation. It was way more catchy than the idea I had. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what we need to do? Pardon? Motion to ratify. Motion to ratify. Are we okay? Right. Okay. Are we all ratified? <laughs> <laughs> all right. We got room full of people. The goes for you. I love it. <laughs> so what do people think? Do you guys like it? I do like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then it's just a... responses from everybody in the room here. So Lovely. I love it. I think it's awesome. Um, it's catchy and it's cute and um, effective as far as getting the eye in the front because um, and people don't really appreciate me saying this, but I'm going to say it again. <laughs> You can test your child when they're born and find out if they're intersex or not. If they're not, they're not. It's never going to change. You cannot test to see if your child is going to be gay, lesbian, queer, transgender, or whatever. Period. Even if you could, it would probably change. Because I know my sexuality has changed a lot in the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> 
And um, so I think it should come first because it is the scientific proof of all the other letters. Because intersex people are born um, genetically or hormonally different so that they have a different structure. Sometimes it's inside, you can't see it. Sometimes it's outside and you can see it. Um, but it's a, a medical situation, um, a medical variation, I guess, is where I really want to use. And that if sex with genetics, there's 10 different ways that X and the Y combine, yeah. and it's really easy. All you got to do is Google how many different ways do the X and the Y combine. And there's 10 different ways that X and Y combine. So for society to be able to say that gender is binary, when we literally know scientifically that sex is not binary, then maybe we need to put that first because it legitimizes every other gender that comes after that and gives you a scientific place to, to start off. But change this card. We'll see what happens. <laughs> and everybody in this room will be putting the I first. And how is it? I B I T L G. There you go. See, they got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm impressed. That's awesome. <laughs> so um, the last part here, unless you've got something you really like to expand on, um, I think we're gonna try and take some questions for a little bit here. And I don't want anybody to think that just because I said it was an hour, I'm going to drag it out for an hour just to be sure. <laughs> um, if we get done with all the questions and, and everything, we might even break off a little early and go back here and have some snacks because we have snacks at our place. Do you have snacks, Val? Wow. Snacks. <laughs> snacks. I don't so, have snacks. I wish I knew I would have snacks. That's why I have So, you got any uh, questions running in the comment thread that we should answer? Um, in the thread, not right now, but anyone who's watching, if you have any questions, please send them in and we can definitely ask them. Uh, Joseph, I have a question for you. Um, I know in some of the work you were doing with some of the legislation, uh, there was some stuff in threads on some of the intersex groups. There's a lot of talk about the word consent in a lot of the legislation that's trying to be passed with regards to, um, you know, non-consensual surgeries on intersex babies. Right. Has there been any conversation about changing the word consent to the word request? So uh, I haven't heard any conversations about that, but I could see how that would work. Um, I can also see how they're going to fight it. Well, I mean, they're going to fight it no matter what, because there's a huge industry around um, non-consensual surgeries. But if legislation is being put in place, I mean, it sort of changes the whole conversation. If instead of waiting for a person to consent to a surgery rather than to request it, that's a whole nother level of knowledge, information, maturity that is implied in the word. I don't know. I just thought I'd ask. Um, I like the way you're thinking, and uh, I will talk to people and see where it goes. Right on. Um, but I have very little faith in passing legislation that will stop intersex surgeries. And the reason why is because um, Rose, Rose Kennedy, I believe it was, back in the 1960s, she was one of those children that would get in trouble a lot as a teenager. And that wouldn't be good for the president person running for president named Kennedy back in the early 60s. So they gave her a lobotomy. Oh, wow. And that lobotomy didn't work very well. She was a vegetable, basically, after that. And the Kennedys fought to put an end to lobotomy. And lobotomy is still legal in America today. And they will tell you the same things that the surgeons for intersex children always tell me. Well, we do it way better than we used to. Oh, my God. Wow. So, uh, so you destroy lives better than you have ever. Uh, anyway, 
don't want to get off on that tangent. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, um, it is called a practice. It's a medical practice. It's not a medical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we did touch on your um, interview series for just a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to expand upon that as in um, comes out November 4th, something like that. Anyway, tell me about your intersex interview series. Well, I during the pandemic, I was in a space where I was being a caretaker. And when I'm in a tough situation, I find that uh, it is best for me to be creative. And I really wanted to up my level of intersex activism. And I thought, what better time to do what I do, which is to tell stories. So I reached out to people on some intersex groups and asked anybody if they wanted to talk to me. And you were one of the people that reached out and said, hey, I'll talk to you. So I put together a battery of questions that I thought were important for people, both in and outside of the intersex community to know, to put a face and a story to this whole notion and concept of, of intersex. So I interviewed, there are four people currently that I have that are gonna be airing. Um, you premiered on the intersex, original Intersex Connect just on Saturday. That airs on Monday, this coming Monday on IMRU Radio, and then that will be available for video because IMR Radio is audio only, but the video will be available uh, on my blog and through my blog starting on Monday. And then every week for the next four weeks will be another interview. And I, I think they're really compelling stories. I think what you told me about your variation and about your life and about your journey is important as well as educational for people who are intersex who have other variations. I spoke to a woman, Edie, who is out in California, Edie Gito Meisner. Um, and her story is really fascinating, as well as the story about her child. Um, and then I spoke to a doctor in Pakistan who holds intersex awareness seminars. And we get to talk about the work that she does to change the way that births are being announced within Pakistan. Um, and then I spoke to an artist. Reveal parties in Pakistan, is that what you're telling me? There, you would be amazed at what is going on, not only within the Muslim community, within the Muslim religion, first of all, with regards to intersex and transgender rights. Um, in Pakistan, transgender and intersex people have way more rights than gay, lesbian, and bisexual people because being gay, bi, or lesbian in Pakistan is still criminalized. They're working on that, but you know, it's amazing how outside of, of the United States, things are a little different for intersex and trans people. So you get to find that out in that particular interview. And that's the third one. It's called Hit on Their Pocket. And we do talk about what the medical industry makes. Well, we don't talk specifically about what they make, but we talk about the fact that it is an industry. There are people who make their living going in and telling parents that it's good to have a surgery on their child to make their child fit in. Well, yeah. Um... I went to the Society of Pediatric Urology page and I dug in pretty deep. I got to the part where they were reassuring the doctors that they will keep a steady flow of patients for them to operate on by discrediting intersex advocates, by um, telling them that DSD and intersex are two different things and that their child isn't intersex, they're DSD. And they had a whole list of things that they're doing to make it so that they still can have the steady flow of patients to do surgeries on here in the United States. Yes, because once you start the process, it is an ongoing recurring thing most of the time for most people. So you're not just going to have one surgery. You're probably going to end up having at least seven in your lifetime if you have one. Yes, I've had at least seven. <laughs> so... <laughs> But the sad thing, though, is that after they do those surgeries, there is no palliative care whatsoever. Um, if you look at the intersex book, and I don't care what city, state, or country you're watching from, if you look in your insurance provider book and try and find the word intersex, the only place you're going to find it is next to the word surgery. 
There are no primary care doctors for intersex people. There are no mental health doctors for intersex people. And there are no specialists for intersex people. You know, I can't imagine what other surgery they would do that removes a part of your body that everybody could know about or eventually see the people you care about the most are going to see. Go ahead and, and do that without any qualms or thoughts about the future of this person and not provide them with any mental health care to help them decide that it's okay or that they're okay. If you're intersex and you go to a psychologist, they're going to treat you as your transgender every time. Mm -hmm. My doctors treat me like I'm transgender now. And it's like, it's way deeper than that. And I don't know how they need to make a law to make the Society for Pediatric Urology to make the University of Las Vegas have a intersex specialty doctorate class and they should start creating specialists and the people doing the surgery should pay for it, in my opinion. I support and you in that. So hopefully if anybody here that is into doing legislation is listening, um, please work on getting us medical care after the surgery is over. And then we'll work on stopping the surgery. But right now there's 139,000 intersex people in the world today and a large percentage, roughly 25% of us, have had surgery and gotten no follow-up care. And 25% of 139 million in my quick bath space is like 75 million people who have had surgery and gotten no follow-up care and got no mental health care and still can't get follow-up care and still can't get mental health care because there's absolutely nothing there. Do you, uh, we have a question. Were you about to say something, Bosch? No. All right. Would you like to present your question, please? Yeah. Um, could you raise a good point about medical care for afterwards? And only because I know the twins out here that um, have had medical procedures done because of faulty things, I guess, you know, when they were younger, not too, and now suffer repercussions. What um, yeah, I mean, how, um, is, how, what is the stats on something like that? How many intersex people, when they were children, had, you know, surgery done to them and are suffering later in, in their adult lives? Do we know anything like that? You know, what's happening with that? All right. So the question is, for anybody that couldn't hear it, is um, basically how many people are getting these surgeries and um, without their knowledge and consent. I also know the threats that you're speaking of. And um, anyway, and then don't have my have repercussions yeah, that's I don't have my flip chart with me. So I got this amazing little flip chart. Yes, you do. Last year, 60,000 children were born to intersex. In Intersex affects people different ways. So we don't have solid numbers. The only people that have a solid number is the society, pediatric urology, and then not give them up. But 60,000 intersex kids were born last year. Not all of them needed surgery, obviously. In fact, 25% of them probably ever, never ever even know that they were born intersex. 25% of them will probably find out later in life, like about the time they go into menopause and Go, what the hell do you mean? I'm in menopause. I talked to a 68 year old man the other day um, who was in menopause, found out he was intersex at that age, and he was totally against taking estrogen, even though it was going to save his life. Um, and hopefully, I talked him into it, taking it. But um, so some people don't find out until later in life. Um, so that's 50% of them. So now we're down to 30,000 kids. Um, again, I need my flip chart. Um, <laughs> um, then we got to figure that another 25% of the children don't need surgery. Okay, so 
Yeah. You know, and then I think the last 25, I break it down because if you take 15% of that last 25 and say that they were absolutely necessary, Necessary surgeries to save the, the child's life. There's things like salt wasting disease and things like that. So then you break it down to 10% of the 60,000 intersex children last year received unnecessary surgeries. 15% got necessary surgeries. In my estimations, these numbers are not so. But it really doesn't matter what this last number is because if you take the 10% of the 60,000 intersex children were born last year, that gives you 6,000 children that were surgically assigned sex in America last year. Then the catch is they got a 50-50 chance of getting it right, right? It could either be a boy or it could either be a girl, which is absolute bull crap. I'm trying to watch my language. <laughs> because there's not only two choices. There is the choice of not doing surgery. So if you consider that one of the options, they got a 33.3% .3 chance of getting it right, which means they have a 66.6% .6 chance of getting it wrong, which means that there's 4,482 children that are going to disagree with their surgery goal assignment every year. 40,000 every decade. And then, if they have the audacity to disagree with their sexual sur sexual surgery assignment, they're banned from sport. They're told they're mentally ill. They aren't allowed to use public restrooms. Their doctors tell them they are they're insane, and they are treated horribly. That's four thousand kids a year in America that they literally surgically created transgender children by the surgery they did and then made laws against them. I don't know how that makes sense in anybody's world, but if you're gonna force me to get my arm cut off and then tell me I have to do everything right-handed or I don't exist, I'm gonna have a problem with that. So the answer to your question is approximately 4,483 children every year disagree with the sexual assignment they were given in a surgery that they were never allowed to choose. So does that answer your question well enough? Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> it's like, what? Well, I mean, and it, I, I gather it is complicated because you really don't have the stats because they're not being um, readily available for you. Well, yes, yeah, the Society of Pediatric Urology doesn't want us to know. Right. Um, because I honestly think the number or should double that, in my own opinion. But I try and go with numbers that I can prove, and I can prove these numbers to the nth degree. But that was only 10% of the 1.7% of the population that's getting these surgeries that they disagree with later in life. I honestly think that number is big. Can't, can't prove it. So I go with the 10%. Um, because if it's 20,000 or 20%, that's uh, what, almost 10,000 children a year? 100,000 children every decade that are getting a surgical assignment that they never requested and never asked for so that their parents could bond with them? That's ridiculous. I just don't. I mean, we're making laws against 100,000 people that we surgically made the way they are. And there's transgender people that don't, aren't intersex. But there's a lot of intersex people that don't agree with the sexual assignment that they were given. So they may not identify as transgender. Um, I don't agree with the surgeries that I received, and I do not consider myself transgender. But I totally am side by side with the transgender community because even if people think that I'm transgender because I'm intersex, um, nobody in the whole world, no, ever should be treated the way transgender people are treated. 
And I don't care if you're intersex and you're against transgender because you don't want to be treated by, like transgender people. Because transgender people shouldn't be treated that way under any circumstances, whether they were surgically created as a transgender person or if nature made them a transgender person. The fact that they're making laws against humans, naturally born humans, is just beyond the scope of understanding in my mind. So I'll get off that soapbox. <laughs> And are there any other questions in the room? Well, and how many trans people really are intersex? Right? Um, okay, could I be? I don't know. I mean, I can't afford to go and get the testing done. And, you know, who covers that you know, to find out if you are? That's a really good question. I appreciate that. Um, Jamie wanted to know, um, and I'll try and put this the way you did. I always edit things. <laughs> um, the question is, how many transgender people are actually intersex? And I think that's a damn good question. Because when you go to the doctor and you say, I don't feel like the sex that I was assigned at birth, they automatically put you in the transgender category. Right. They don't do right. karyotyping. They don't check your hormones. They don't do anything. I personally, since I've been here at the center, have gotten 12 people that were in the transgender community and talked to them and they told me their story and I said, you need to talk to your doctor about this situation and see if, that, if it's real. I was right all 12 times. They were all intersex people that thought they were transgender people up until that time. And they still identify as transgender, most of them. Um, but yeah, there's a whole lot of transgender people that are actually intersex and don't know it. And they fall in that first 25% that I was talking about of the 60,000 kids that are born, go your entire life and never know you were intersex. You may have disagreed with your gender assigned at birth, but they don't even look into it. I am 58 years old. I had my first karyotype like a week ago and I've been intersex through the medical community and my medical records for 12 years and this is the first time anybody's ever looked to see what variation I might be and because there's 50 variations of intersex it's kind of like throwing a dart at a dartboard and hoping that you get the right one because nobody's going to pay for 50 tests uh, the karyotyping helps give you a direction, but it also oftentimes comes up as 46XY DSD is what they call it. 46XY DSD. It's the most ambiguous um, diagnosis. There we go. That is the most ambiguous diagnosis of ambiguous gender that I've ever heard of. Because Basically, it's like, well, you're 46XY, and you were born a hermaphrodite in my particular situation. And that's all we know. We don't know why you were born a hermaphrodite. And it's like, oh, OK. So we'll never know? No, correct. So I mean, there's reason for there's people who are intersex. They don't even have a test to figure out why they were born intersex. They were a natural variation of human being that was naturally born that way, and there was no outside effects on that on the situation whatsoever. So, um, and the hormones and the genetics are good. And we do have another question in the room. Uh, there's also one online whenever, when you're ready. No, why don't we do the online question first so I don't hog up all the space. Okay. Uh, well, someone asks, what barriers and or opportunities uh, do you see for intersex communities to advance their human rights via, uh, via allyship with other current or historically marginalized populations? Um, I see that the we're stronger together. So the more we can build, you know, a coalition of people that understand everyone else's situations, the, the better. So um, 
I know this past year when the Black Lives Rally uh, and Black Lives Matter movement really happened, to really see how everyone came out to support this one particular movement, I think keeping in contact with those groups is huge. Um, people fail to re really remember and realize that the Black Lives Matter movement was actually started by a lesbian. <laughs> so we already have a good crossover within our different communities in terms of all seeking rights. So I say working together is probably the best thing that we can do. And that's probably one of the greatest opportunities that I see um, in terms of a barrier. Oftentimes people are so focused on their own journey toward equality that they fail to see others. So the more we talk and communicate, the better. I hope, let me know if that answered and does anyone else have any input to that question? If you don't mind. Um, one of the biggest obstacles the intersex community has for coming together is that they divide us in so many different ways. There's 50 different ways to be intersex and a lot of them are very similar. And they will go through there and do the genetic testing and they'll find one hormone that's a little bit different than the other one and yeah. then they'll make a whole new category. So they keep dividing us into smaller and smaller categories so that it seems like there's fewer and fewer of us actually existing on the planet. And then they divide DSD and intersex um, because in 2006 at the intersex consensus conference in philadelphia they uh, decided to stop using the intersex word in the medical community um, and so therefore up until then intersex and dsd were the same thing dsd wasn't used very much and then it was cutting down on the number of surgeries that they were able to do so they needed to get rid of the natural variation of human being and turn it into a disorder of sexual development and so if we can get the TSD and the intersex people together and the Turner syndrome people together and the PCOS polycystic ovary syndrome people together, because there are people with polycystic ovary syndrome that are intersex, they aren't all intersex, but some of them are. And if we get all these people to come together and say, as a one voice of 139 million people shouting at one time, we might actually get something done. But right now we're all divided by intersex and DSD and Turner syndrome and, and anti-androgen sensitivity syndrome and CHS and things like that. And we just need to come together and realize that we are all one very discriminated against group of human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm gonna go to the question room real quick. Dr. Ray, what's your question? Hey, I would love to hear the elevator pitch. You want to hear that? Oh. Question? <laughs> <laughs> that right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 For that question. Yeah. Marsh, you want to give us your elevator pitch on intersex? It's extremely high level. It is in no way medical. It is just to get people to understand. And I say, you know, we're all, we all start off with an X chromosome, which means we all start off as female and later in development, that other chromosome, that other part of the karyotype, the X or the Y kicks in, which either keeps the ovaries inside and the clitoris short or drops them down to become testes and elongates into a penis. And anywhere along that process, anything can happen. That there always has people riveted. <laughs> so it's <laughs> high level. But I mean, I, I also I also have hand movements. It's like ovaries up and down. It's <laughs> short or tall. It's very musical. Like it really does get people engaged. Either that or they're just mesmerized. But if I can get through that, which is usually like a sentence or two, I usually have them hooked and I can get them to listen more about intersex and intersex rights. There you go. We're gonna have to uh, get you to put that on video so we can learn the hand movements as well. Uh, so. Well. We're at an hour, Jessup. So yeah, we're out of time. You guys can continue on. Um, Are there any other questions before I let Mouse go? go I, I just want to say thank you so much. I'm changing my entire presentation now because of that. that with the awesome. hand movements, with the clitoris, with the penis. <laughs> I'm just throw it all in there. I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Right on.
Thank you. And uh, I don't know if you heard that Bosch, but <laughs> I did. Great. I did. You did. Hear. Okay, good. Because I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. And remember, IBQDLG. <laughs> there you go. All right, Bosch, I would really like to thank you so much for uh, doing the second episode of the original Intersex Connect Live. And we're we'll doing another episode uh, the second Saturday of November, whenever that is. Um, and I'm hoping for 10 a.m. because. 5 p.m. gives me all day to stress out. I didn't enjoy it at all. So we might be doing it a little earlier than we thought. Well, for anyone who's watching now um, who might want to be a guest, you know, they should definitely get in touch with you because we're definitely looking for guests to continue on with the original Intersex Connect on the show. Gmail, let me know. Yeah. Uh, and um, Bosch, thank you so much. I uh, could not have done this with you. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you. So, Thanks for having me. And thank you, everyone, for being here and for everyone for watching. I really appreciate the love and the acceptance. And we've got a lot of work to do. So let's keep it moving. Bye, Bosch. All right. Thanks so much. Have an awesome night. Bye -bye. And Bye. you're awesome.